Welcome everyone uh, to this presentation uh, organised by Mackay Conservation Group uh, about the Irwin's turtle. Uh, my name is Peter McCallum, I'm the coordinator of Mackay Conservation Group. I'd just like to acknowledge that the meeting today here in Mackay uh, is on Yui country, um, the home of the Yui Barra. Uh, the, the people who have lived in this land for thousands of generations and maintained its uh, wonderful ecology for all of that time. Um, we'd like to pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. But we'd also like to acknowledge the, the, uh, the Wirri and uh, Berry people who are the river people who, whose country uh, the Urana Creek is part of uh, and the Massey Creek and the Bowen River, uh, Broken River. So um, they are leading the campaign to protect uh, the, the uh, Urana Creek from uh, a, a new major dam and to protect the Irwin's turtle that, uh, that has that, that location as its main habitat. Um, <clears throat> so what uh, we're doing tonight is uh, having a, a couple of presentations, one from me uh, about the Irwin's turtle uh, sort of briefly, and the, um, the threat that the Urana Dam poses to that species. Um, we also have Nigel Barrett from the World, uh, sorry, Barrett. <laughs> Nigel Parrott uh, from the World Wildlife Fund, who's uh, their rivers campaigner, who will be speaking about the broader um, imp implications for the Burdekin Basin of a number of dam projects that are currently on the books. Uh, after which we're, we'll hear from two researchers who've been working on uh, on the Irwin's turtle. Jason Schaefer is a PhD candidate at uh, James Cook University, and he's been doing work to learn more about the, um, the Irwin's turtle and uh, its its distribution uh, and the structure of its population. And I'll tell you more about why that's, that's happening soon. Um, uh, the other researcher is Cecilia villacorta Rath. She's uh, a molecular ecologist working at uh, James Cook University. And I'll let Cecilia explain what a molecular ecologist is because I couldn't work out how those two terms fitted together myself. But, but um, uh, yeah, so that Cecilia is looking at, you know, developing assays and other uh, chemical um, uh, compounds that, that would help identify DNA of various different species in the environment and how you can get involved in this, uh, the campaign that we're running to protect the Irwin's turtle and the other species that reside in those, those important rivers west of Mackay. So here's um, the beautiful, um, Broken River, uh, on my understanding, just, just near the, the mouth of the, the, the Urana Creek. It's one of those beautiful streams in uh, central Queensland, or probably the most beautiful stream in central Queensland. It it's, uh, hasn't really been impacted heavily by, by European development. Uh, and un, un, you know, contrary to what other people have been saying, that it's a clapped out bit of cattle country, this is, this is a really beautiful part of our world. Uh, it's, um, it, according to Ian Sutton, who used to be the coordinator of Mackay Conservation Group, he's a, a biologist who did an assessment of the Urana Creek way back in the 1990s, I can't remember the exact date, but you know, his view of that was that it was the most pristine stream in central Queensland. It had not been uh, modified in the ways that other streams have been and didn't have all of that sediment and nutrient flowing into it that, that other streams do. So, uh, you know, that, that's probably alone a reason for protecting that stream. It's also Witty and Bira country uh, and it's home for the Irwin's turtle. Uh, and one of the really important things for the Irwin's turtle is that it provides clear and reliable water. Um, the, combined with the nearby Massey, Massey Creek, the, um, the, the Urana, Broken and Massey Creeks form uh, what they call wetland aggregation that is listed as a being of national importance. So it has specific features uh, like certain species of trees, uh, black iron box, for instance, that are you know, there's some, uh, some very unusual large examples of those in that place. 
the the Wirrian uh, Berry people, the Wirri, uh, uh, the the Wirri of the mountain people, and the Berry are the um, are the people from the uh, from the river. Mm. Uh, consider this. Well, th this is their land. It's been determined uh, as well. Wide law has recognised that uh, that this is their country, but they know it's their country. They've lived there for since time immemorial, and have always respected that country. That you know they're part of it, and the the important cultural um, practices that they have depend on that that river. Um, as they say on their website, um, urana.com.au, the river is sacred and, it, and it's life itself. Um, but in order for them to maintain their culture, they need to maintain a connection with the, with the Urana Creek and the Massey Creek, those other streams in, in that, that area. Uh, and as I said, they're leading the charge on a fight to protect this land. That's um, Uncle Ken Dodd, who's uh, one of the uh, traditional owners who's involved heavily in working to protect the Urana Creek. Uh, here's uh, Ken uh, with the Irwin's Turtle, along with Patricia, who's in the room here tonight, um, our former coordinator and uh, uh, you know, a person with long history of research uh, skills but also extreme passion for the environment and care for country. And again, there's a photo of the Brighton River, another one just taken a little bit later than that earlier one you saw. Um, this is the, um, the website that the, the Wirri and Berry Berry people have put together. Uh, it's called urana.com.au and it's full of useful resources and I'd urge everyone who's in this meeting tonight to uh, go to that website and sign up for their mailing list so that you can find out more about what's, what's happening with Urana. Uh, you're already on our mailing list, so we'll keep you up to date. But in order to find out more about the, um, the cultural uh, values of this, this area and the importance of it to the, to the uh, traditional owners, then you should go to that website and find out more. Now, Irwin's turtle, um, uh, or his scientific name is Elsea Irwini, it was uh, discovered in 1990 by Bob and Steve Irwin when they were out on a fishing trip, and one of them hooked onto this uh, unusual turtle that they, they dragged up, took a photo of it, and then sent that photo off to John Cann. This, this photo is um, from his book, uh, Freshwater Turtles of Australia, that we have a copy of on the back, on the table behind uh, people in the meeting room here tonight if you'd like to have a look at that. Um, it's also a great book if you're interested in turtles to purchase. Uh, it's published by the, uh, the CSIRO and uh, includes uh, descriptions and a lot of information about every single freshwater turtle species in the country, including Owen's turtle. So after they discovered that um, this, this unusual species, they sent it off to John Cann and he, you know, he identified it as something unusual. Uh, it wasn't for another three years that the, um, uh, that, that the turtle was uh, eventually captured and the specimen was able to be uh, identified. So a type, uh, a, a type specimen was captured and they were able to fully start to fully describe the, uh, the species. Um, the main habit, as far as we know, the main habitat for this uh, species is in the upper Broken River system. So, the, um, uh, so that includes the, the Irana Creek and the... Um, uh, the Massey Creek, so they're, they're west of Mackay. Um, it, it, it may, it probably also exists upstream from the Burdekin Dam uh, in some of the streams that have the right sort of habitat, um, but it may have been severely impacted by the, the uh, construction of the Burdekin Dam that happened before the species was discovered. So, you know, we'd already done things to help uh, push this species further towards extinction before we even knew it existed. Um, the, um, one of the really interesting features of this species is that it has a, um, the ability to take oxygen out of the water like a fish does. Um, so it pumps in oxygen uh, through its cloaca, which is the, the, the rear end of the turtle where it lays eggs uh, and defecates and does all sorts of things. So this species has an additional feature where it can 
suck water in and has um, a membrane of sorts that can extract, exchange oxygen uh, with the water. And so for that reason, you can spend an awfully long time underwater. And so part of its foraging activity is to, is to spend time way down on the, on, the, on the bottom of the water for extended periods. So really, it's really important that it has clear water that's flowing fast and mixes with oxygen so that it can, um, it can extract that, that oxygen from the water. Um, nearly time, okay, well, I better hurry up. So the Urana Dam is going to threaten that species by silting up those creeks, turning them more cloudy and slowing down the water flow. Um, if I can get my thing to move on, there we go. Uh, where are we? Yeah, here's a map. I just still wanted to show you that. So Mackay is to the east on the right-hand side of that map. Uh, if you follow the, the Pioneer and River and Cattle Creek right up into their headwaters, you come to Youngla. And then north of that, uh, near Mount Dalrymple, which I think is the third highest peak in Queensland, uh, the Urana Creek starts and just south uh, west is the start of the Massey Creek. Where the Urana Creek meets the uh, Broken River uh, and it will, the, the dam, the waters that are impounded will flow right up into the Urana Creek and the Massey, Massey Creek. Here's a, a political statement by our uh, beloved member for uh, Dawson, George Christensen, who's um, putting the, um, uh, the word out that there's a bunch of greenies out there who are going to go and lock themselves on the machines and uh, stop this dam from occurring. Well, we're going to be leading a very strong campaign, but we don't engage in that uh, in uh, civil disobedience. Other people may be interested in that, but um, we're, our, our work will be building a case against this dam. And there is a very strong case against it from an economic and uh, environmental perspective. So is my time, my time's up. I will now hand over to Nigel Parrott from the World Wildlife Fund. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, so Peter has just asked me to give a little bit more background on Urana Dam proposal and um, some of the other dams that are on the radar in the Burdekin Basin. So if built, Urana Dam's going to store 150,000 megalitres of water. That water is earmarked to support 25,000 hectares of irrigated agriculture downstream from where the dam's going to be built. Uh, according to the uh, preliminary documentation that the proponents pr uh, put forward so far, that water will also be used to support coal mines in the North uh, Bowen Basin and possibly as far out as the Galilee Basin. And it will also be used to generate hydropower. Uh, and we're not sure whether that's going to be from pump hydro or actual uh, normal hydro that's bolted onto the, the dam wall. Um, Urana Dam's been declared a coordinated project under the State Development and Public Works Organisational Act. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it gets fast tracked through the state level uh, assessment and approval processes, but it does get a bit of an easier path through that process. Um, it's also been referred under the EPDC Act um, so we managed, so myself and Peter managed to get some comments in on the referral, uh, which we hope the Federal Environment Department are duly noting. The other interesting thing with Urana Dam is that it will, if built, it will be privately owned and operated, which within itself raises some very interesting policy and public interest issues that haven't yet been addressed. The other major piece of infrastructure that's proposed in the Burdekin Basin is raising the existing Burdekin Falls Dam. So the proposal there is to raise the dam by another two metres, which will then store an additional 150,000 megalitres of water. Now, the water uh, from it will be used to support regional development. I'm not really sure what that entails at the moment. Um, and there's also a proposal to bolt some hydroelectricity kit onto the, the raised Burdekin Falls Dam to generate power from it. Um, it's also been declared a coordinated project under the State Development Public Works Act and Sunwater, who's an opponent, is currently working on the terms of reference or preparing the terms of reference for it. 
just going back to Rana Dam, the uh, proponent for it, they're also preparing draft terms of reference for the EIS for that project as well currently. The other big one in the Burdekin Basin is Hell's Gate Dam. Um, so it's located at Hell's Gate in the upper Burdekin catchment. Um, it's proposed to store something or in the approximately 2,110 gigalitres of water. Um, if built, that water will be used to support approximately 50,000 hectares of agriculture in the, in the, uh, in the upper part of the Burdekin, and possibly that water will be used to augment Townsville's water supply. But the, uh, the business case that's been done to date for that certainly indicates that that's a very expensive option, so it may not be feasible. The other uh, piece of infrastructure that was announced last week by the Labor Party is that if they win the election, they've committed to building Big Rocks Weir. So Big Rocks Weir is located downstream of where the, Hells, the proposed Hellsgate Dam is going to be located uh, and quite close to Charters Towers. Um, if it's built, water from it will be used to irrigate approximately 5,000 hectares of land. Um, the types of crops that are likely to be grown it isn't clear at the moment. And it's also not clear whether that particular project will require an EIS or will be um, designated as a coordinated project under the State Development Public Works Act and or will need to be referred under the EPBC Act. So it's early, stay, early days for that one, but Labor have committed to building that, uh, that uh, Big Rocks Weir if they win the election, as I just said. The other thing that comes into play with water resource development in the Burdekin is the Burdekin Basin Water Resource Plan. So it was established in 2009. Um, Water plans are supposed to be uh, reviewed and replaced every 10 years, but the Burdekin Basin Water Plan has been, the life of it has been extended to 2023. So that's coming up in the, in the near future, the review of it. And under it, there's a bunch of water, unallocated water that's held in various reserves. So in the general reserve, which is water that can be used for any purpose, there's 200,000 megalitres. There's a strategic reserve for state purposes, which amounts to 35,000 uh, megalitres. There's another reserve for uh, some water, and there's about 8,745 megalitres there. And then there's two big other strategic reserves. So one for Razik and Vertical Falls Dam, which is 150,000 megalitres, and another one for uh, strategic water infrastructure in the Bowen Broken Catchment, which is Urana Dam, another uh, 150,000 megalitres there. So some key issues with all of these, uh, all of this proposed water resource development. Well, firstly, there's simply not enough water in the Vertican Basin for all of these proposals, um, evident by the amount of unallocated water that's under the Vertican Basin, currently under the Vertican Basin Water Plan. So in addition to the adverse impacts that are going to be traded by each dam, if they all get built or if some of them do get built, there's going to be a whole bunch of cumulative impacts that occur from the, I suppose, the alteration to flows from all of those dams that might get built. Now, currently under both state and Commonwealth assessment and approval processes, cumulative impacts from multiple development don't get accounted or don't get assessed at all. So that's a major concern in the Burdekin. If, firstly, if all of these dams get built, which is unlikely, but if some of them, particularly uh, Urana and Razik and Verticals Dam, and also Big Rocks Weir, the cumulative effect of those is going to be quite significant on uh, downstream environmental values and the GBR. The Two other thing. Two minutes. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that's going to affect the GBR is the increased amount of sediment, nutrients and pesticide that's going to result from all of the new agricultural development that's going to hang off, particularly Urana and Razik and Vertical Falls Dam and Big Rocks Weir. So 
not only do we have to consider the, the localized impacts, but there is going to be significant impacts to the marine receiving waters. And as I mentioned earlier, another major concern is the, the policy and public interest issues that it's going to come up and have to be addressed from privately owned and operated water infrastructure. So that's mainly Urana Dam and Hellsgate Dam if it gets built. So the concerns there is whether the proponent is a suitable, well, a, a fit and proper person or entity to be able to manage uh, privately, a privately owned dam, let alone having the resources to properly operate and maintain the dam, and particularly in regard to necessary safety improvements that will occur over the life of the dam. So there's a whole bunch of really curly issues there that haven't been addressed. Um, and the other big issue is most of these dams are likely to be uneconomically viable. And that's due to the pure fact that building and operating dams is hugely expensive and irrigators are either unable or reluctant to pay the cost per megalitre to generate a return on lower costs. So if these dams aren't commercially viable in the long run, and with them being privately operated, there's a chance that the proponent might walk away from them, as what happens with coal mines, for example, when they become uneconomical, and then the Queensland taxpayer would be left with the burden of either having to manage these projects into the future and or decommissioning them. Here's one for Nigel, actually. Yeah, I, I probably can't answer this one very well, but um, who will buy the water from the Urana Dam and what will it cost? And then we've got one from Brooke in the room as well, so I'll just... Uh, short answer to both of those is unknown at the moment. Yep. The water is likely to be um, uh, too expensive for most types of irrigation, according to uh, an agronomist who was presenting up at James Cook University only a week or so ago, uh, saying that, you know, like the only types of crops that are likely to be able to afford to use the water from Urana or other dams within the Burdekin are uh, things like avocados uh, or chilies and capsicums, of which all of them are in abundant supply at present. So it's, you know, like, um, I think he was talking about a uh, 17 or 20 fold increase in the, in the supply of avocados so in northern Queensland or in Queensland. So every time you go to the shop and you buy an avocado, put an extra 19 in your bag because uh, that's, what, that's what would be needed in order to consume all of this additional uh, crop that would be grown. So there isn't really a, a good justification from an agricultural perspective for this. Is the Urana Dam and these other dams, are they to be built by the government using public money and then privately operated, owned and operated? Um, I'm confused. Okay, so yeah, I can answer that. So Urana and Hellsgate Dam, if they're built, they will be uh, privately owned and operated. So there won't be, well, supposedly, there won't be any public money used to construct either of those two dams. Raising, raising, and raising Burdekin Falls Dam and building uh, Big Rock Weir, they will be funded by the, the taxpayer. Um, thanks for being here today. Thanks for the people who are able to be there um, and for the ones that are um, on Zoom. Um, and thanks, Peter, for inviting me to be part of this event. Um, I work at Dropwater in James Cook University, and I work on a technique called environmental DNA. I'll explain about it now. And the title of my talk is Hunting for the Irwin's Turtle Using Environmental DNA Analysis. So I'll start talking about um, classical survey um, techniques in aquatic ecosystems. First of all, they rely on physical capture or visualization of the animal and they have different efficiencies, simply because there are species that are difficult to find. Um, some of them require a lot of effort. Um, species that are a low abundance, they might be a bit trickier to find just because they are not that susceptible to falling in traps, for example. We also have the issue of site access, especially when we are talking about remote Australia. Um, bringing an electrofishing boat, for example, to some sites is quite challenging. Um, and also we have cryptic or shy species, such as the case of the Irwin's turtle. 
And of course, we live in Queensland um, and we have crocodiles in many rivers here. So you don't really want to be setting up traps or nets um, and be hanging out in croc territory. However, if you cannot catch them, you can catch their eDNA. eDNA stands for environmental DNA. Um, and it's a technique that relies on um, the principle that all organisms leave traces of DNA or genetic material into the environment where they live. So if we're talking about aquatic organisms. Organisms set, um, shed cells into the water. They um, shed uh, mucus, uh, feces, urine, or um, reproduction uh, when they are reproducing. There's also um, a lot of material in the water. So we can capture this eDNA um, and we can extract it in the laboratory and we can screen it for the presence of target species. eDNA um, is, can be done either for single species, which is called targeted eDNA, and it can be done for um, a multiple um, number of species, which is called metabarcoding. So single species detection is um, the work that I, that I do currently. But also metabarcoding um, is a really important um, technique when you want to have um, an idea of the biodiversity of an area. So I'm just going to talk about uh, just three or four um, applications of targeted eDNA that are relevant to what we are here um, to talk about today. First of all, targeted eDNA allows us to do species detection. So we can either use it for, for example, cane toad detection or any other pest species detection. And at Trop Water, we are um, currently conducting cane toad monitoring in the Torres Strait Islands um, and in Moreton Island as well. And it can also be, of course, used for species detection uh, in the case of um, endangered species or threatened species. And JCU is also conducting sawfish monitoring in Northern um, Australia, both Queensland and Northern Territory. With eDNA, we can also detect cryptic species. There's this study um, done by scientists from Curtin University in Western Australia, targeting blind eels, and they simply sampled groundwater and they were able to detect the presence of these species. So using traditional methods, this would have taken a lot of time and a lot of um, money, probably. And um, the important thing uh, for us today is that this eDNA can also be used for species distribution determination. So in the case of um, the Irwin's turtle, we can apply eDNA techniques to determine um, its distribution in some remote upland areas. I just want to show you all some examples of um, eDNA, how it is sensitive and how it, it compares to traditional methods. So it has been shown, for example, that it has higher sensitivity than traps to detect cane toad presence um, in places where there's really few cane toads. It has also higher sensitivity than pike nets. So this study um, tested uh, pike nets for, um, to capture um, common carp, oriental water loach, and perch, and they um, determined that eDNA had higher sensitivity. And finally, eDNA has also higher sensitivity than electrofishing. In this particular study, the authors, they tested brook trout detection using eDNA methods and using electrofishing. And electrofishing was more successful at more sites um, at detecting the target species. Um, so let's concentrate on um, this specific application for the delineation of uh, the species distribution. And in this case, um, I am planning to use the eDNA technique to detect Elsea erwani. So as you know, Elsea erwani is um, a species within the Australian snapping turtles. And we have different species distributed in different areas um, of Australia. And Elsea erwani is here in um, central Queensland. So the plan is to sample um, different sites along the Burdekin, the Bowen, and the Broken Rivers. And we are collaborating with the Department of Environment, uh, the, sorry, the Department of Natural Resources, Mines, and Energy, who have just been to the field and they have collected samples along the Burdekin. Um, here is the Gorge Weir. So I don't know if you can see that this is the, the Burdekin Weir. 
and they have also collected samples here near the Yangala Dam. Um, they have gone to the sites where there is easy access by car. However, um, we would like to sample Urana Creek and we would like to sample Massey Creek as well. And the upstream, um, so the upland distributions of Urana and Massey Creek are, are quite remote and it's, it's very, very hard to get there by car, as you may know. So what I'm planning to do is just uh, use a chopper to take me to those um, sites in here, in those upland areas. Um, and then I'll be going to each of those sites, getting off the chopper, um, collecting water samples, and then going back and then uh, moving on to the next site. So with this, um, we are um, gonna be, I will be able to be covering this area in um, a short time, so probably two days max. Um, and then once that sampling is done, I'll bring those samples to the lab we extract the DNA and we screen it for the presence of um, R1 I. So hopefully um, we'll be able to fill in um, gaps in knowledge of the distribution of the species. And to my knowledge, and Jason will probably sp speak about this um, after me, um, but to my knowledge, these upper parts of Urana and Massey Creek, they have not been uh, surveyed for um, R1 I. So I'm hoping that we will be able to shed some light into the distribution of the species. So just a few take home messages um, before I finish. Uh, first of all, eDNA is a sensitive tool to detection of um, rare species. And it is time efficient. Um, and time efficiency um, translates into cost efficiency because sending people um, to the field, it costs a lot of money, especially in remote areas. Um, eDNA is very useful to de delineate species distribution However, it's just another tool in the box. eDNA is not going to, uh, it, it is not a silver bullet and it's not going to replace any traditional method. Uh, we still, there's still data that we can know, we cannot know from eDNA analysis, for example, age distribution, size classes, or we cannot distinguish between male and female through eDNA analysis. So we still need traditional methods uh, to complement um, the, the, the whole Sure. Uh, we've got a couple of questions, uh, so maybe Cecilia would, might want be interested in answering. So um, John Connell was asked, um, I guess the DNA doesn't last long, so DNA you detect is just at the sites and not come from upstream or somewhere else. Um, so I'll just yeah, leave you with that one. Yep, that's a really good question. eDNA can be transported and the time of the year, especially in Queensland, because we have the wet and dry season, the time of the year when you sample is quite important. So we are conducting this sampling right now um, before the rain start, because we want that eDNA transport to be minimal. So there is some, there is some mix of factors that um, come into play for eDNA detection. So there's eDNA degradation and eDNA transport uh, mainly. So um, if you have turtles, um, in a pool, in two pools that are, for example, 20 kilometers apart in this time of the year because the water flow is not very fast, then you can expect that eDNA to degrade um, while it's getting transported between pools. So by the time you sample uh, a pool downstream, if that species is not present there, then you won't find it. So you need to take into account the ecology of the species and the environmental factors of the particular site in order to plan um, and design your um, sampling. You collect water and somehow take the DNA of the species of interest amongst the other mass of DNA that must be there. Yeah, this is correct. So we collect the water samples and this water sample, it contains eDNA from everything. Um, the bacteria that are there, the fish, the turtles, even our DNA, because um, we are shedding DNA as well. So um, the thing is that we have particular genetic tags that we use once this eDNA has been extracted, these tags um, through, um, um, it's a bit complicated, it's called um, qPCR, so it's a quantitative polymerase chase chain reaction. Um, it's just a process by which the particular DNA 
that matches the tags that you are putting into the reaction is going to be amplified. And only that particular DNA is you're going to be able to see it. Um, so it's really important to have those tags to be specific for the species that you are targeting. But it's, um, it's what, what we do all the time. Can the technique be used to determine the volume of the species in the area? So I guess if we can, if we have a, if we can have an idea of the abundance of the species, um, and in theory this can be done. There are studies that have um, been done in the lab, testing if there's a, a relationship between amount of DNA that you recover and the abundance of the species. However, this is really specific to each species and each um, particular environment. So while it can be done. A lot of um, research has to happen first, um, just to calibrate. Um, so we would need um, to run some trials at places where we know the exact amount, uh, the exact abundance of the species, um, and to see how much DNA um, you have recovered. Um, but there's also con confounding factors such as transport, as I spoke before. So um, even if we could determine with um, accuracy the, the amount of um, turtles that inhabit a particular pool based on the amount of DNA that we recover. There is the issue of DNA transport. So if we have more abundance upstream from the site when we are sampling, then that might confound um, the results. I'm with a PhD student with Tropwater at JCU. Um, and let's get right in. Uh, so Queensland is home to a number of specialized geographically restricted freshwater turtles that possess a specialized physiology and unique remote mode of respiration, basically that they can breathe out of their butts they, by taking uh, oxygen directly out of the water um, through two specialized organs called bursae. Um, this physiological and special mode of respiration of respiration exerts some significant influence on their habitat preferences and in stream distribution distribution patterns in uh, in northern Australia. Um, as a result of well, part of this, the current geographic distribution of these species are likely to also be a consequence of post Pleistocene aridification. So, i.e., that they were about Prior to you know twenty to forty thousand years ago, they were much more widespread across the across the country uh, when times were much wetter. And as the uh, it dried out, they've been kind of contracted into these individual catchments. Um, as a result of this, um, they're extremely vulnerable to changes in their natural environment. And you can see from these all these pictures coming down the side at the top here, we have. Fitzroy River Turtle, Riodides leucops. Um, I can't remember what I, I have to move something here. I can't see. Uh, we have soft shell turtles. Oh, don't do that. Go back. <laughs> we got uh, Elisa Macrurus, the Mary River Turtle here. We have Elsea Irwini from the Vertican and a couple other catfish. We have Elsea. Albagula, the white-throated snapping turtle from the Fitzroy, Burnett, and Mary River catchments. We have uh, Elsea Sp, formerly Elsea Sterlingi from the Johnson River catchment. It's north of Innisfail in North Queensland, and we have Elsea Lavaracorum from out west from the Gregory Nicholson. As you can see from this slide, the Queensland is actually Australia's butt breather biodiversity hotspot. <laughs> it's a little bit um, it's a little bit hard to see. So this is this, this top this top map here is mostly just the, all this is exclusively just the biodiversity of Alsea species in sort of Australasia. So starting in the west, I'm sure. I mean, I saw uh, Cecilia already went through this, but you have in the Kimberleys and sort of western um, Arnhem Land and NT. You have Alsea dentata. In northeastern Arnhem Land, you have Elsea flabby ventralis. From the Gregory Nicholson and Calvert Rivers on the in the Gulf, you have Elsea labrocorum. And then this is a, a bit of a simplified version here, but this is Elsea irwini from the Burdekin catchment. You have Elsea albicula from the Fitzroy, Burnett, and Mary. You also have in the in the Fitzroy, Burnett, and Mary. You also have a couple monotypic species such as. 
the Fitzroy River turtle. Um, further to the south in the Mary River, you have uh, Eleusa macrurus. And um, yeah, that's about it. So just looking at this other here, you can see it's, you can see these are a little bit oversimplified and there's other catchments. Um, sorry, this is such a mess here, but on the Northeastern Australia, each of the Elsaeus populations that we get are, are restricted to the specific catchment. So as you can see from up here, you can see the, the it's not quite the burdekin as is extending right up the coast, but that's actually just going to show you that there's a distinct population in the Dane tree. There's another one in the Johnston. And then on the other side of the Burdekin Gap, which is a kind of a, a biophysio, um, sorry, a biogeographical barrier, you have the Burdekin, the known extent of Irwini there. You have the Fitzroy, and you have the Burnett, and the Mary, or the other I'll say uh, the Gulas and things live. For rest of these species, because of their in constant contact with the water, um, our river regulation, and that essentially through altered flow regimes, through impoundments and climate change, as I've touched on before, given their um, historic sort of distribution in this country. Um, and both of those things, the impoundment and river, reg river regulation and climate change result in de decreased flows and changes to decrease and decreased water quality. Um, Another one is the large-scale agricultural practices, such as land clearing, um, which uh, increase sediment input, um, and dams themselves, impoundments, actually act as sinks for sediment too, so that increases the sediment load further downstream. And on top of all this, these structures, such as dams and weirs and impoundments, they act as barriers that restrict the movements of animals, and they also increase the adult mortality through trauma inflicted when trying to bypass. So when a turtle's trying to go over the top of one of these things in a, in a large flow, for instance, they kind of bounce down the side of the, the dam and get, get smashed a bit. Some of the other issues that we have, that these turtles have, are nest damage, invasive weed, and predation through invasive predators. So things like invasive weeds like your parthenium, your lantana, um, your past flora, your native passion fruit and stuff like that tend to choke riparian zones and make it hard for turtles to access suitable nesting habitat. Um, things like foxes, pigs, cows, um, damage nests and predate on nests. Um, and that leads to uh, low recruitment from something that doesn't um, survive very well as a, as a young animal in the wild anyways. Um, Let's just continue going. So the because of all these things, the conservation status of these turtles in Queensland, uh, Fitzroy River turtle is vulnerable in Queensland and nationally. Mary River turtles is endangered in, in Queensland and nationally. The Gulf snapping turtle, Lavaricorum, is vulnerable in Queensland and endangered nationally under the EPBC Act. The white throat snapping turtles is endangered in Queensland and critically endangered nationally. Nationally, however, I'll say Irwini is listed as least concern, which is a bit concerning. So, this is I'll say Irwini. There are three closely related but distinct populations that occur in Northeast Queensland. One of them from the Burdekin, one from the Johnson River, and one from the Daintree River. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to mostly, oh, I'm going to mostly concentrate on the Burdekin River population. Um, there are medium to large sexually dimorphic species in that there's a different size between males and females. The females are much bigger than the males. As you can see, they get up to five. The biggest ones we've caught so far have been up to about five and a half kilos. Our males are about 1.3. And shell lengths on females get about 36 centimeters. So they're quite, quite huge. Um, the adults are largely herbivorous, but are also opportunistic omnivores in that they eat terrestrial and aquatic vegetation, including like leaves and sticks, the stuff you find weird stuff in their stomachs. Um, aquatic invertebrates, including insect larvae, freshwater bivalves, and gastropods, and opportunistic carrion as they find it. And we've even found cane toads in these turtles, which is 
very, very interesting as the only other species known to be able to eat cane toads is saw shells. Um, they prefer areas where water is clear. Sorry, this and typically well oxygenated. Um, generally, ooh, sorry, generally over sandy, rocky substrates. So, oh, the species is relatively new to science, and it was discovered in 1990 by Bob and Steve Irwin near the junction of the Burdekin and Bowen Rivers. In 1993, uh, well, they, they sent some, they took some pictures. Bob took some pictures and sent them to John Can, who's a well-known um, turtle researcher based out of Sydney. Um, sent some pictures, and he got all excited, and he came up in 1993 because he identified them as something unheard of, never seen before. And he collected the first holotype of the species in 1993 in the actual lower Burdekin River near a stream from Air. Queensland. And then he came back in 1994 to collect the paratype, which is the sister to the hollow type. So the hollow type is, if you have an if, you're, if you don't know, it's, it's the specimen that's held and perpetually preserved in the museum that acts as the basis for all other comparisons, um, sort of scientifically in the future. So it's a very important collection. It's a very important specimen. And the hollow type and the paratype are the, like are the two, two very important entities. And the paratype was captured further upstream uh, at the junction of the Bowen River and Sandalwood Creek. And in 1998, the species was formally described by John Can. So we've been known about these for a long time. And after studying, after doing my honors on uh, the Johnson Rivers um, and um, completing that, we're very interested in to, uh, to go and have a look at these other ones. And so we spoke to John Can, and he gave us some good info about where we could go and have a look. And we then traveled to the upper Broken River. As you can see in the, this figure here, you have, we're in South, we're in sort of central north, north central Queensland. You have the Burdekin River, lower Burdekin River catchment here, and you have the upper Bowen slash broken subcashment. Um, so after after confirming the presence of Irwin I in the upstream Broken River, mark recapture and distribution work commenced by myself and my supervisor at the time, Dr. Ivan Waller, in 2006. Our work at this time concentrated on a 30-kilometer stretch of the upper Broken River that included Massey Creek and Urana Creek. And so this 30 kilometer stretch went from Adaluma Station up into up the Broken River itself, which is about 11 kilometers downstream of the Burdekin Dam Wall, which is located down here. Um, and that's where we uh, initially initially focused our work. After this time, during that during during those two years, roughly two and a half years, we captured about 115 individuals from about eight sites. That included 96 females, 8 males, and 11 juveniles. Now, from this, we estimated the population, given ex its known extent, to be probably about 5,000 individuals. Due to the low ratio of juveniles to adults that we uh, that we observed initially, um, we were kind of raised a bit of concern. Um, because the population seemed a bit out of whack. There's very, very few males to females and very few females to sign that something's not right, that maybe there's something that's affecting the recruitment of juveniles in the population. So due to this work, we decided to formally nominate this species to be classed as endangered at the national level for the EBSAC, the EBSAC. EC Act in 2007, 2008, somewhere around there. And when it came back in 2009, the nomination was rejected due to insufficient information pretty much across the board, which was not surprising, I guess, um, on distribution, population, demographics, ecology, and threats. So obviously we uh, had to go back to go back to the back to the field and do some more work. 
So some of the knowledge gaps that we identified um, that probably that most likely contributed to the rejection of the nomination were parts of the um, taxonomic uncertainty with closely related populations, namely the populations in the Johnson River and the newly found population in the Daintree River, which was found by myself and some colleagues in 2010. Um, outside of the Upper Broken River study population, which is the only study population of Elsa or when I in the Burdekin, there have been no formal or systematic surveys to look at the distribution or assess the population abundance of these species. Um, and despite this, you know, despite the fact that we're not getting very many juveniles and very few males and stuff like this, we don't really have any sort of, at this point, we didn't have any sort of the threatening processes identified. We had ideas, but we didn't have enough information yet to put our finger on anything. You know, one of the things that we didn't know is there was, you know, nesting requirements were completely unknown and in fact are still completely unknown because we haven't been able to find any nests so far. Um, as you can see, this is the, this map here is the culmination of all the records that I have for Elsa Irwin I in the Burdekin, starting at nine kilometers upstream of the Yungala Dam. We, Ivan Lawler and I snorkeled and canoed into the Yungle Dam in the up, very upstream Broken River. Um, the main study extent that I talked about before. Um, I've gotten one juvenile in a cast net just downstream of the Collinsville Weir. And I've gotten good anecdotal reports from my unit station. This CAN 94 is the paratype. This Blue Valley is. Um, Another well-known spot, they were found at Strap Album, and this the rocks down at Air is the site where the original holotype was collected. So what has been done to, ooh, crap. So what has been done to address these gaps so far? Well, we continued with our um, mark recapture up until 2012 when our funding ran out. And up to that point, uh, we've caught so far. We've caught a total of 400 individuals, of 84 percent of which have been marked with an identifying notch. And um, 211 females, 29 males, 66 juveniles. Um, in 2008, we had an honor student undertake a detailed detailed baseline dietary analysis, and 2000 and. 11, we had a PhD student, Erica Todd, who looked at the genetics of all the extant I'll say, attempt to try and sort out the relationships between um, all the extant species and um, get that sorted. Um, on top of that, because we didn't know anything in the threatening processes, um, crap, sorry. Um, we tested the environmental conditions in which Irwin I is able to cloacally respire. And through that work, we we're able to establish that elevated sediment loads have a negative effect on their ability to remain submerged. And in concert with Erica Todd's phylogenetic work, I commenced work, the, the field work required in the Daintree to um, collect specimens and work on distribution of that species as well as um, carry on with the genetic analysis to further re-describe the relationships between the, the three populations of Irwin I, between the Daintree, Johnston, and Burdekin catchments. I thought I'd show you just something we just, uh, the diving experiments. As you can see, this figure on the right-hand side, you have your temperature, your, these are white is clear, that's turbid, and you have temperature, uh, dissolved oxygen, uh, 25 and 100 percent, and you have temperature, uh, temperature low, temperature high, and turbid under turbid can, under clear conditions is you're getting up 97 minutes, and under turbid conditions uh, at low temperatures you're getting roughly about 20 minutes. So that is how it affects. I would go through it if 
That's okay. I think we can see that the um, increased turbidity and the change in temperature really affects their ability to dive. Uh, is that, that the point? But that's yes, the point. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's the point. So the, the, um, the, turbidity, the turbidity level that we used um, in this study was um, taken, it was basically the sort of the middle ground that you'd get in um, in, in the upper Broken River. Um, and so, and we simply doubled it. So it was about 40 uh, milligrams per liter. Or, so normally it's about 40 milligrams per liter up in the upper river. So we doubled it to 80 roughly, and we got an effect. Now these conditions, these turbid conditions are rarely encountered um, at like 80 milligrams per liter suspended sediment are rarely encountered in the Connors River, but they are more regularly encountered as you go downstream into the Burn and Bowen and Burgerton Rivers. And it's actually encountered about 50% of the time in the Fitzroy River. So both of these rivers, the, the Bowen, um, the Bowen, Burdekin, and the Fitzroy have been identified as the most single contributors to sedimentation onto the Great Barrier Reef. And they kind of raise concerns that um, um, it's have the, the low recruitment that we're experiencing with a lot of these bimodally respiring turtles in Queensland could possibly be a result of um, suspended sediment um, related survivability issues in these river systems. But more work needs to be done to um, assess the um, the ability between adults and juveniles and um, look at the, the population demographic side of the outside of the Broken River. How do you examine the common contents of turtles? Uh, um, you, uh, it's called, it's, it's not the nicest thing, but it, um, it's called stomach flushing, mm -hmm. where you, um, you actually very nicely put a tube down their throat and you, you hooked up to a water pump and you uh, turn the water pump on and hold the turtle upside down and try and flush everything that's currently in their stomach out of it. I suppose that's way better than uh, cutting it open. <laughs> it's way better than cutting it open, uh, Jason. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you wouldn't do that. You could also probably use some of Cecilia's eDNA techniques if you really wanted to as well. Mm -hmm. But that's uh, pretty high tech for what we've been able to accomplish so far. And um, so in order to uh, complete your research, like what sort of money is involved in that? Is it um, like, a, you know, is it something that a student could do or does it need better funding? Um, so at the current point in time, um, so I've been in contact with, uh, obviously with Cecilia and the Department of Natural Resources and Mines who are helping Cecilia out with her eDNA work. And we've uh, kind of identified the, the gaps that I've been chatting, that I've chat to, chatted to you about today, and sort of the steps that need to be, to be done um, in order to address the problems that we have currently with this species. Um, so the first, the first step is obviously to work out the actual distribution of Elsea Irwini within the Burdekin catchment. As you know, we haven't formally gone down sort of any further down through the lower the lower broken into the Bowen and into the lower Burdekin itself, nor have we gone into the actual Burdekin Dam or above it. There is one record of uh, Elsea Irwini apparently from Fletcher Creek just north of Charters Towers, <clears throat> but I've, I've gone there and I jumped in and uh, I didn't find it and I was there for a while on I'm not sure. I'm dubious as to if they occur above the dam, but it's a big, it's a big unknown. And as you know, there are multiple infrastructure like um, projects um, in the Upper Burden um, that would need to take this into account based on our current knowledge, which is kind of zero, right? Yeah. Um, the next step after that is so that's that's um, so Cecilia and the. DNRME are working on that with their um, eDNA. And the next step after that is to go and ground check any new areas, <clears throat> as well as start the field work. And that's the systematic, systematic surveying and trapping of individuals in order to get some sort of 
semblance or handle on the relative abundance of these um, of the of the Irwin I in these in these areas, and that takes a little bit of specialized gear, and, and it takes a lot of manpower, and it takes it takes a lot of time to um, establish whether or not you know populations are, are rising or falling or having some sort of impact. So um, those are the next two steps that are going to essentially give us what the status, the conservation status of, I'll say, Irwin I and the Burger can go um, is. Um, sort of the money involved in that, um, to put, I guess, uh, an approximate value to at least have a good go and account for the, the time and the equipment required. Um, you're probably looking at upwards of a hundred grand oh. in order to, um, to cover, um, you know, you're covering probably, you know, close to a hundred, hundred, um, kilometers of river of rivers, mm -hmm. um, on foot or in boat. And, um, there's, there's crops. <laughs> it's fun, it's fun, it's fun work. <laughs> but uh, it would uh, it re require a substantial input of funds in order to in order to afford the time and uh, effort required. All right. Well, that's good to know. I could, you know, nothing ever happens for free. Uh, so, you know, hopefully there's someone out there who's got the money, uh, either as a department or uh, an organisation that might be able to help uh, get that project completed. Because I think it really would be great to know that. The El O and I is not threatened. That would be a, that'd be a fantastic thing to know um, in the long term. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for coming along tonight. Uh, it's been good to find out more about this particular species that all, uh, most of us probably know nothing about. There's a, like I said, a great book by, called Freshwater Turtles of Australia that John Can, who uh, wrote the the species uh, description of this um, of the El O and I, um, that is available. Uh, there's also a really good artwork here in the Environment Centre for anyone who's in Mackay who wants to have a look at more details about everything around the uh, Elsea O and I. It's all in one simple uh, painting. So um, you should uh, come in and have a look at that as well. Um, just to, in terms of next steps, um, there's a, you know, we, Mackay Conservation Group will be putting in uh, a submission for the terms of reference of the um, the Urana Dam and Pipeline project, and that, uh, is, is it, to our best knowledge, is likely to um, to be put out for public comment sometime in the next couple of weeks. So there'll be uh, a period of time, um, probably four to six weeks, when the public can comment on that. We'll be working hard to ensure that we put together a, uh, a comprehensive uh, submission on it. I will also be sharing with you and with everyone else in our community, uh, uh, you know, a, a simpler uh, solution where you can put in a submission uh, about the terms of reference for this particular species and the dam that threatens it. Um, we'll, um, we'll also be working on a longer campaign looking at, uh, you know, like the, the economic uh, implications of building a dam. As Nigel was saying, you know, this, this project may end up being, um, something that the proponent can't make any money out of and they walk away and the people of Queensland end up with a, um, uh, with a continuous drain on our, our resources, our, our, our taxpayers' money. So what we want to sure, be sure of is that there is uh, an, a real economic benefit if anything happens. But what we've seen so far is that 19 assessments have been done of the Urana Dam since about 1963. And all of them have said that this project could never make any money. We really don't know how this uh, new project is going to do that, but we'll wait and see from the proponent how that happens. What we'd, we'd like to ask you um, to do is to join us in, in helping with uh, your skills, uh, your money, uh, your, um, your time, and if you have networks of people that you think could also share, um, you know, or contribute to this campaign to protect the Urana Creek, to protect the, home, the habitat of the Irwin Sturtle, then we would really like you to, 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 um, 
to be part of that. So we'll we'll email everyone who came to this meeting and ask you, you know, whether you can contribute in some way. So we've got one more question from in the room, uh, from Brooke, what were you going to ask? I was gonna ask, so when the LNP says they are going ahead with this project, does that mean they're putting it out to tender? No, at the moment, um, the project is what you call a, uh, a coordinated project under the State Works and whatever it is Act, the, the coordinated general managers. So first of all, they have to develop terms of reference. So that is, what are the things that you need to look at in an environmental impact assessment? Then they have to go away and conduct the environmental impact assessment that will look at also not just the environmental issues but the social and economic issues around the dam and then uh, if then that will uh, come back to the public for comment and then eventually the various ministers so the federal and state ministers would have to make decisions and then there'll be a whole bunch of processes like um, uh, you know local government approvals there'll be approvals uh, if they build a hydro plant from the Australian energy market operator There'll be, you know, all sorts of people will have a say in whether this goes ahead. So when the LNP or anyone says, we're going to build this dam, then they might want to see it built, but that doesn't mean that they are going to approve it. Okay, well, look, thanks very much, everyone, uh, for participating tonight. Sorry we've kept you a little bit late because of the technical problems that we had, but I'd also like to thank the, all of our presenters tonight, um, the... Uh, there was Cecilia villacorta Rath, who's a, a, a doctor, a, 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 has a PhD in molecular ecology, uh, well, in various things, but is a molecular ecologist at James Cook University. Uh, Jason Schaefer, and also uh, Nigel Parrott from the World Wildlife Fund. So thank you everyone for coming along, and uh, we'll keep you informed about this, this issue and uh, many others that come up, and uh, we'd welcome your participation in the future.